we've been prophesying about a sound coming. We've talked about it. Is it a certain frequency? Is it a new style? Is it, uh, it was all, a lot of it was focused around worship. About two weeks, no, it was a month ago now, about a month ago, I was ministering at Northwest Christian Fellowship, which I'll be there Wednesday night if anybody wants to join us, uh, in a place called Hope Thursday night. If any of you want to come, just holler. We'll, we'll have a good time with them. Um, right in the middle of my teaching, he told me what the sound was. And it's real simple, but for some reason it was revelation to me. And um, he said, and have you ever had that? You're in a conversation with somebody or speaking, and he gives you revelation about something totally off the subject. And he's like, why do you do that? Uh, it's just the way he works. I guess because you're in one flow and just more stuff enter the flow. Uh, you're already listening to him and just more stuff enter. But he just said it's real simple. He says this. He says, just now, and this is a word for us, is the body of Christ ready to flow in a new sound, and you're doing it. He says, yes, worship is a part of it. Music is a part of it, but it's much bigger than that. The sound is simply this. We are moving as Christians from being an echo to actually listening to what He is saying for us and our assignments, and we say it. We release the sound of what we're seeing, hearing, and doing in the third heaven in our spirits to those around us. And when we limit it to just music, music is good, but when we limit it to just music, and our band has been doing this for a long time, I don't know how much you listen to music in other spheres, but most of it's an echo. An echo is this. I'm repeating what I've heard somewhere else. And I do a lot of echoing, and that's fine, because God speaks through other people, and we can echo what they say. But, he, but there's also a place, and we're doing it in music, where we're releasing a sound that we're hearing from the Father God right then and there over that people right then and there. And so music is doing that. That's why it's not always on a projector. That's why it's not always uh, something you've heard before. The psalm says every day, wake up and sing a new song. You might can make a doctrine that music teams should get a new song every day. That's a lot of work, especially when you do music and everything else in it. But there's a principle there. But see, he's wanting to affect the whole world. He needs a new sound in the whole world. The world is just messed up right now. It's corrupted, it's, and it's been given over to the voice of the devil, and Christians have allowed it. Now, we don't rise up in antagonism. We don't rise up in violence. We don't rise up, or at least in physical violence. We don't rise up in that way. But it, people think the weird stuff that's going on in the world, you fill in the blanks, is normal because there's no sound from heaven in saying this is normality. And in love, He is starting to give us insight, direction, guidance, and His views on those situations around us and ourselves and our marriages and our family and our work and wherever our influence is, that we're to speak in love and then when we hear from God, okay, this is how you speak into this situation, big, small, little influence, lots of influence, when we do that, there's an authority and an anointing that comes from heaven on top of your words and penetrates those things and pierces the darkness and the deception that's over people. That's the sound that He's releasing in heaven. And that sound comes and is predicated on each of us spending time in the Lord to hear what He is saying. That's the sound. If you have to sum it up, what's the sound on the earth? What is He saying? It may be playing, if it's music. It may be something else. Each one of you, He is wanting His sound released into the earth, into all regions and all spheres of the earth. And it's starting to happen. And so I'm going to... That's the right order of doing this. Um, turn over to Jeremiah 
This is what's happening right now. There are two different prophets. I'm not a prophet, but the Lord often gives me prophetic words. Not over people, but, I mean, He does that too, but over congregations. There's two major types. One's foretelling what's going to happen in the future. If you want a lot of that, listen to Chris Reed. I've never seen anybody on his level. Now, this is the thing that I like about him. He's very specific. Very quickly we'll know if he's hearing the Lord or not getting it because they're so specific. But he does a lot of foretelling. Then there's another kind that's forth-telling. Telling forth of the times and seasons that we're in. That's more of my stream. I don't foretell, or it's been very rare. But I do foretell, and the Lord gives me lots of times and seasons that we're in. I can usually tell, okay, this, there's four seasons a year, physically, at least in this part of the world. If you're in Florida, there's probably two. Maybe God doesn't move there as much. But I know in the Spirit, there's at least four, I'd say at least four seasons a year. But in heaven, the seasons mean a little different. It might be one every month or one, one every year. Because on the banks of the river flowing from the throne, those trees are continually in season. They're continually prevent, uh, doing um, fruit. Now, I know I'm not teaching line upon line like I normally do. It's more of a prophetic flow. Just if this is different for you or not track and just say, Holy Spirit, help me to understand. Um. We're in Jeremiah 12.5 right now. Let me read it to you out of the good God's Word translation. And we'll tie it into the sound here. If you have raced against others on foot and they have tired you out, they tired you, tired you, how can you compete with horses? If you stumble in open country... How can you live in the jungle on the Jordan River? We're right now, He is for those that are listening to the Holy Spirit. This isn't just those going to church and doing their duty and being saved and glad of it. There's pros in that. I mean, there's blessings in that, but that's not who we're talking about. Those are lukewarm Christians or maybe cold. These are the ones that will sit through an hour and ten minute worship service saying it's all just about you. That will tell you the temperature of where you're at spiritually. Can I sing for an hour about Jesus Christ and Him alone has nothing to do with me and for Him to inherit the kingdom and the earth? That will tell you your level. If you're not there, go, Father, draw me unto you. Song of Solomon 1.4. It's about a bride. It's about Solomon pursuing his bride. That's one level. But it's on a bigger level. It's about Jesus Christ pursuing His bride, which is us collectively. Ephesians 5 backs this up. It says, Husbands, love your wife as Jesus Christ loved the church who died for her and suffered for her. He pursued her on the cross. And so Song of Solomon 1.4 says this, Draw me unto you, Jesus. So if you want more fire, more hunger, or feel like you're getting lukewarm, just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, draw me unto Jesus. Jeremiah twelve five. If you have raced against others on foot and they've tired you out, how can you compete with horses? This is using a, a country agricultural metaphor. It doesn't mean quite as much to us. How many of you actually have horses? How many of you ever rode a horse? Most of you have. Okay. <laughs> I've not been thrown off a horse. It's going, okay, you're getting tired running as a soldier and you're not even on a horse. How, or you're getting tired as a soldier on the ground. How are you going to compete with soldiers on horses? So, Craig, what are you taking out of this? Maybe I'm taking the analogy too far, but I honestly believe that right now he is leading every person in this room because you're hungry. If you weren't hungry, you would not be in this place. It's just the truth. Unless your spouse or somebody drug you and along and you don't want to cause, you want peace when you get back home. But you wouldn't be here if you're not hungry. So this applies to all of us. He is transitioning us from fighting the enemy on the ground 
to riding horses. Now, many times when people read this, they go, man, the battle's going to get more intense. It's going to get harder. And this, I don't see it quite that way. Would you rather fight the enemy on the ground, poking up with your spear, or would you rather be riding a horse, poking down with a spear? There are two different perspectives. And he in this room with you and me and the other prophetic community, all prophetic community is is we're listening to his voice for the sound for us. He is trying to get us to position in a different viewpoint and a different location so that we can kill more of the enemy cover more territory from a higher position faster with less effort. Now, me and Sean have talked a lot, and I think this is a word for at least us two, maybe you. We've talked about, okay, we're getting more sleep, we're eating better, how come we're more tired? Because we've been fighting from a position that was of the last season, the last wineskin, And we're trying to press in and go, Father, how do I fight and do what I'm doing from a higher position, do more with less effort? And he is, he is trying to speak, and it's hard. I mean, we're a product of our habits and products of our routines, products of our thinking, and moving into newer stuff is always a challenge. A lot of times he just does, sometimes he says just do this, but most of the time it's like he sort of leads you to see how hungry you are, to see how much you want to lean into it. What is it, Proverbs 25.2? I may have gotten the the passage wrong. It says, The glory of the Lord is to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search out a matter. I did quote that right. I'm not sure it's Proverbs 25.2, but you get the point. He conceals stuff to see if we're hungry to go after Him, and lukewarm, gold Christians, cold Christians won't ever get it. But we're not lukewarm in here. I mean, like I said earlier, you can't be lukewarm and stay in this atmosphere for long. It it just is like, dude, these guys are weird. They're crazy. I don't want this much stuff. I just want to ease my conscience. Do you know I I had a revelation the other day that I got a very clean conscience? That's because I don't use it much. That was a joke. Probably true, but. So, we're going to pray here for those of us that are tired. We're going to pray for two things. Those of us are tired to learn how to fight from a different position. Part of it is learning to fight what he tells us to fight. Part of it is learning to move how he tells us to move. And to only do what he tells us to do. As Christians, we're constantly thinking that the more godly thing is to keep adding to our plate. I'm here to tell you the more godly thing is to take stuff off your plate. Seriously. No matter what anybody else says or what the past expectations were, take it off. More authority comes with more simplicity. This is the greatest time to be alive. I mean, we may not can see it right now. You're looking at the depravity and the lawlessness in the world. It's just because it's reflecting the righteousness and the holiness that's that's growing in the world. We're a small minority, but it don't take much. This, if I could go back time and say, when would I want to live? I would love to see Jesus in the flesh. But I don't want to live then. I would love to see the Apostle Paul in the flesh, but I don't want to live then. I would love to see Martin Luther King and, and the whole Protestant Reformation crew, Calvin and Knox. I'd love to see them guys. It would be fun. John Wesley, George Whitfield. Wouldn't it be cool to go back 250 years and see George Whitfield doing circuit riding during this area? 
and going, I'm going to be in the future 250 years. Wait till you see how many churches are here. It blows my mind. But this is the time we were made for. And it's going to take a whole other level of hearing and skills, and we're on that path. <clears throat> First four chapters of Revelation talks about seven churches, seven angels of the churches. They were literal seven churches. I've been to the ruins of five of them. Two of them I, have not, I did not make it to. They were in a different part of Turkey. I said ruins on purpose. There's nothing there there. There's not even a city there anymore. It's just ruins. Most of them, some of them don't have hardy ruins, maybe one little wall. What happened? Some of them didn't overcome. Every one of the churches says, to him who overcomes. Somewhere, maybe not the first century, but maybe the fourth, fifth, or third, they didn't overcome. There's a constant battle that we have to fight to say, I want to see from a higher position of the horse. What are you saying today? Now, those were seven literal churches. Many people, and I'm one of them, think that you can also go around the world or even different periods of history and show this particular period or history is characterized by this seven church, this, this one of the seven churches. I believe America is characterized now, maybe the other ones too, but very strongly, the Laodicean church. That was the one that said, you think you're wealthy, but you have no clues. And it goes on and on. Think you're rich, but you're poor. He says, I want you to be hot, not lukewarm or cold, or I'll spit you out of my mouth. I have no idea what that means. I mean, they were Christians. They were meeting. They were saved. What does that mean, spit you out of your mouth? I don't know. I've worried about it. thought about it for decades. But this is what I know. I don't want it to happen to me. And he gave them the choice, says, you can go after it if you want to. Many times, especially if you come from um, a Reformed background, like the Presbyterian church or, or is the most common. There are some Reformed Baptist churches. We put too much emphasis on the sovereignty of God. I believe in the sovereignty of God, and I believe in the free will of man. How they come together, I have no idea. They're both biblical. I believe in the sovereignty of God, but I live my life like the free will of man. And somewhere they intersect. There's a theological lesson there for you. You can go back and wrestle with the Father, because they're both in the Scriptures. So right now in America, for Christians, maybe the West to Western Europe, I think they were there probably 20, 30 years ago, this is the battle for us to hear His voice. And I think most of us are hearing His voice, but the battle is this. Am I going to speak it when He shows me where to speak it and how to speak it? That's the battle. It's a battle of being, living a bland lifestyle or a bold lifestyle. Let me be blunt. I don't want to get morbid here, but I think it's sort of good. You're going to die. And a lot sooner than you think you do, Will. I'm not saying you won't live a full life, but no, very few people say you die at 102. Very few people at 102 think it's time to die. I got you thinking on that one. Paul in Acts 10 says, pray for me that I will run the race, finish the course, and keep the faith. Acts 10. From the best we can tell, he said that ten years before he died in prison or under Nero. That's Not all theologians agree on that, but he did fall off the map ten years later. Some people said he maybe went to Spain. Maybe he did. I don't think so. I think when he witnessed to Nero, Nero had enough. But who knows? But in Acts 20, he says, My time is up. I have run the race, kept the faith, and finished my course. He knew it was time to go to heaven because he had done everything the Lord had asked him to do. 
And I'm telling you, that anointing is on this room and it's on this generation to spend enough time in the Lord to say, I have... He knew ten years earlier what he was supposed to do. He didn't give specifics, but he knew it. This is what I'm supposed to do. And then when you've done it, I've accomplished it. Why should I be on earth anymore? We'll leave it to the next generation. And you quietly give up your spirit, or maybe you're persecuted. I don't know, like Paul was. That's the way to go. Not wondering for 50 years what my purpose is in life. How do I find my purpose? You get before the Lord, spend time in His presence, and He'll tell you and you'll follow the peace of God. It's as simple as that. Everybody's different. I preached, was it last week on the callings or the week before on the callings or seven different areas. You can go get it off the website. It was a good teaching, good apostolic basic teaching, maybe called the family, politics, whatever. And just get that and let it soak in. Find where you're calling is and know it two and a half years ago I had a death experience most of you probably remember that I was in Hamilton Hospital for nine nights literally felt my soul start to leave my body I was totally at peace and I, this is a lot of thoughts go through your head but there was no anxiety there was no weirdness there was no regret I just said hmm I haven't finished all that the Lord had told me that I'd finish but He's the master. If he wants me to go on, so be it. Because he told me I would live to at least a certain age. I'm nowhere close. I said, well, I didn't prophesy. He did. And I knew I heard from the Holy Spirit. And about that time, and several people's come to me. Shane is one. My other, Ken Cooper, my other brother, had different encounters with the Lord, I think, about at that right time. And all of a sudden, I felt, the, I felt the spirit of death over me. All of a sudden, I did not see him, but I felt Jesus come into the room and put my soul back into my body. I was like, okay, all right. That's a pretty weird way to make sure the, the prophecy is fulfilled, but if he wants to go to that end, he can. What's the point? You right now can know what the Lord's calling you to. And then with boldness, not being flimsy about it, but being fearless, not being cautious, but being courageous. You will not die. If you're in the will of God, you will not die before your time. It's just I'm telling you from personal experience. I knew it before and actually experienced it. Because you and I are created to be a sound in this earth. What does that mean to tell people what the Lord is saying? might be to your neighbor, might be to your spouse, it might be to a group of work, and you say it in a way that's not all religious, but it's, it's wisdom coming through. And he's releasing a sound like I've never seen. And we are privileged to be a part of this prophetic community. I'm really telling you, to be, to have the honor to hear what the Lord is saying at this early phase. Sean and I recently, I can't remember the details, it doesn't. We were talking about, you know, the Lord's using me more than ever. I'm hearing better than ever, but I'm, it's just, I'm not getting excited like I used to. And I said, because it's becoming norm. That's good. It's becoming the status, the new status quo. That's the way it should be. Not that you ever take it for granted or presumed, but we're, how many of you get to the place you're just expecting to hear God all the time? You're expecting to hear God regularly. That's cool. That's good. So I'm going to pray over you. We're going to stand and we'll end with this. And they're going to do a song. I'm going to pray for the sound. Whatever. See, we can't define the sound. I was looking for a definition of a sound in the music area. No. Today, the worship... I can honestly say this. It's not this way every week, although most weeks it is. Today, the sound was what we needed for today. People go, why don't you record your worship services? First of all, the Lord told me a flat no. It's like he might have started the recording on here out of habit. We're not publishing what I just spoke today. Why? What they played and what I said is the sound for the people here on May the 7th. Not that you can't get anything out of it on May the 8th, 
But the Holy Spirit has things at Kairos times, which is just times for them, times for people to hear, places to be. That's why it's so important. Lord, where am I supposed to be? Because where you're supposed to be, you'll get something for that time as you go forward. And so their sound today, they couldn't duplicate that if they wanted to. They don't even remember half of what they said, probably. Like, I'm not going to remember half of what I said. It's all the same flow. But it was a sound for us today. And it was intense. I love it. I have preferences for certain kinds of streams, but I'm going to listen to whatever stream he's in. But I'm going to pray over you. If you want to be prayed over, just stand up for boldness, courageous, and your... I'm not talking like shouting from a street corner. It's in your personality. It's in your way. It's in your thing. To be the sound. Why? Because Whitfield County or New, New Mexico, right? New Mexico that Cindy's from, wherever you're from, they need to hear what the Father is saying. Saying sound. You get it? And He chooses to use you. Well, why don't He just do it sovereignly? He could, and He does. Why does He use me? I don't know. Faith, free will, and sovereign comes together, and He just likes doing it that way. And it's fun. I'm scared. I know. It'll get easier with time when you get used to His voice more. But we're going to pray over that. And then I'm also going to pray for any of us that have tiredness to learn how to reposition, to ride, the, to, to fight and move on a horse instead of the older ways that we've done. What does that look like? I really don't know, but we're going to prophesy it and He's going to show us. It usually starts with a prophetic word in the heavenlies and He moves it into the practical. Prophetic always leads to practical. It's just, it's good. I mean, it's good. Because he says, pray what's in heaven into the earth. This is biblical. This is Matthew is it Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer. Craig, you're getting weird. No, I'm just repeating the Bible. It says, whatever is in heaven... Who had the shirt on earlier? Where's Kirsten? Is she already gone? She had it on the back of her sweatshirt because she's gone. Um, said, uh, whatever is in heaven on earth. So it starts with heaven, the prophetic, hearing what's there, or seeing what's there, or smelling what's there, or dreaming what's there, or internal vision of what's there. He speaks to us a lot of ways. Or an angel showing up and telling you what's there. They're all cool ways. But the most common is the still, small voice. Why? Because he's inside of you. Why does he need an angel when he's inside of you? Sometimes the angels come, but usually the angels come because we had not been listening to what's on the inside of us. It's like, this is an important word. He come and shakes us. Well, you got angels all in the Old Testament. Why? Because they didn't have the Holy Spirit on the inside. If you were Mary and you heard a voice, you're going to get pregnant and no man. you have known no man, I guess eventually you would know it was God when the baby started growing. That's a pretty big deal. You need an angel come and announce this thing. And so, Father, I just pray over that my family here, my fellow brothers and sisters, this group of people, and I thank You. We say right now, whatever sound You want to release in the earth, our earth, our garden, whatever that looks like, our family, our people, whatever sound You want to release, help us to hear You clearly. And as John 15, 9, or John 5 says, Jesus only did what He saw the Father doing. In John 12, He said, yeah, I only said what the Father said. Father, help us to hear. I pray every person in here hears clearer than they've ever heard before. And thank you that we can hear from you. It says Romans eight fourteen. those who are the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. We are sons slash daughters. And I pray we hear clearer than we've ever for, not just for us, but for people around us. Do you know the anointing that us charismatics like to talk about is not, is not for us in the Bible? It is for an assignment. It's always for something. And so, Father, we want to hear Your voice, and then You show us where, and then we're going to thank You for Your anointing, Your grace, Your power, whatever You want to call it, onto that situation. And, Lord, thank You. And we're going to release Your sound into us around us. And, Father, where we've been tired, show us why we're tired. What are we doing that's not lining up right. Maybe something physical, like we need to sleep more. We, we're fighting, you know, we're, we're getting five hours of sleep and that would have worked in a time, but no more. Or we're doing stuff the, just the plain wrong way. Well, we need a slight modification. Father, teach us 
how to fight and lead and run on the back of horses. And Father, I thank you that I was born in 1960. You put your date in. Some of you will be around long after me. Probably most of you in this room. And that's a good thing. Me and Joel, all we're about the same age. We'll all be in heaven. Looking down on you, cheering you on. Going, I finished my race. I kept the faith and, and um, run my course. And I'm cheering you on. Do it, do it. It's worth it, it's worth it. The earth needs you. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that we hear your sayings, your sound better than ever, and you're going to show us practically how to release it. In Jesus' name.